Go ahead and take your Bibles, open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. Now we took a small break from our study in the book of Revelation for a number of reasons. Number one, it can be sort of overwhelming sometimes. And so occasionally while we're going through this, we're just going to take a break and, and let you soak up what we've studied and then keep you wanting for more so that you ask for it. And uh, some have asked if we're going to get back into this study and we're going to begin back into it tonight. Now, uh, we have in the past been going a little bit slower through this book because really the beginning of the book of Revelation sets the stage for the rest of it. Tonight, we're going to begin moving at a bit quicker pace as we go through this. Uh, tonight, we're going to effectively cover about four chapters of the book of Revelation. And that's a significant amount of Scripture. So we're not going to have time to, to really analyze everything that we look at, but we're going to give an overall idea and then draw some points of application at the end of the lesson. So we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7, which will begin the, the study of our text. But before we do that, let's just do a bit of overview, <coughs> or a bit of review rather, to remember where we've come from in our study on the book of Revelation. Entered into the study, we began to study about the descriptions of Jesus and how the descriptions of Jesus lended us towards a Savior who could, who could essentially save us. And as we began to study through, we saw the seven churches of Asia who were in pretty bad shape as far as their faithfulness to God, but the message was continually of hope. And as we followed our way through the book of Revelation, we have kind of followed the central theme of the whole book. You know, men have tried to complicate the book of Revelation for many years. The central theme of the book of Revelation is that we win. That's how it ends. Through Christ, we have victory. And that's what the book of Revelation is trying to communicate. And so we saw a number of things that took place. We took a look into the throne room of God and what that looked like. We saw God who had the scroll of destiny in his hand and remembered. And Jesus was like the lamb that was slain, and Jesus stood up, and he took hold of that scroll, and he began to open it. And if you were each seal, each seal brought about a new piece of history unfolding and a new series of events that took place. We worked our way through those seven seals, and now we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 8, and the seventh seal has been broken. If you'll look your attention down in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, I just want to remind you of the scene that's going on as we dive into our next set of sevens in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. When he, that is Jesus, opened the seventh seal, and that was on the scroll of destiny, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. And when uh, he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings. And an earthquake. So the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And so you have this, this scene that in the midst of the chaos of the seals being opened, a moment of, I don't want to say a moment of silence, but a moment of pause is given as the judgment of God begins to be unfolded. And that's what we're going to see because as these angels take the seven trumpets, they're going to blow the trumpets. And as each one of these trumpets is blown, just like the seven seals, a series of historical events unfold. And we get privy information to what's going on. Now, the seven trumpets that blow indicates to us very clearly, and I'm just going to kind of give you the sermon in a nutshell like I did this morning. The seven trumpets that blow indicate the victory of the persecuted church over their persecutors. These are what these seven trumpets represent. And so the whole message of the book of Revelation so far has been, hey, as a Christian, you're going to suffer persecution, and that's just kind of the way it is. You're going to see persecution. Paul said that in Timothy, didn't he? To Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so the message of Revelation has been uh, persecution. The suffering of persecution is coming, 
But as these trumpets are blown, we see the justice of God dealt out. Namely, we're going to give attention to two things. Number one, God's goodness. And number two, God's severity. And these are two qualities of God that have to go hand in hand. So let's look down in Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. And we're going to study this evening the seven trumpets that the angels blow, what they signify, and some application we can draw from them. Trumpet number one is found in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7. This is going to be what we call the trumpet of God's judgment. Trumpet number one is the trumpet of God's judgment. Now, when we look down, I'm not going to read the entire text of every trumpet because it gets longer and longer as we go through. But when we look down in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7, what we see is that the first trumpet is blown and we have this phrase, hell and fire mingled with blood were thrown to the earth. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7. Now, if we remember anything about the Old Testament, every time hell came down on a city, it was not a good thing, right? That takes our mind back to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah that was punished by God. We add to that the fact that hell and fire came down and that that hell and fire was mingled with blood and it was thrown down on the earth. It gives us a picture very clearly from Genesis chapter 19 of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were living a sinful life, and God punished them. So this first trumpet, as we look at it, it describes the judgment of God that's being launched on someone. Now, our big question we have to ask, and this has kind of been the question that has perplexed people for years is, who is the judgment on? That is, who are we about to read about in the next few trumpets that God is passing his judgment on? And that takes us to trumpet number two. Trumpet number two down in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 8 is the trumpet of what we're going to call the recipient of God's judgment. Trumpet number two is the recipient of God's judgment. And again, we don't have time to go through each detail of every one of these trumpets. And that's a good study for you to go home and do as you learn more about this book. But trumpet number two is who this judgment is being passed down to. We see the phrase in... <coughs> Excuse me. We see the phrase in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, that when this judgment is passed down, something like a great mountain burning was thrown into the sea. Something like a great mountain burning. Now, if you, if you take your mind back to the Old Testament, there were a number of times when cities were taken over and they were described with this kind of graphic language. One of the most popular is Babylon. That as they were overthrown, I believe it's, let me check the notes. Jeremiah chapter 51 says that after Babylon was destroyed, it was compared to a burning mountain. That is, it was just like a, a heap of trash that was just burning overly and over again. And if we remember, as we study through the book of Revelation, it is my opinion that, that the idea of Babylon and the idea of Rome run parallel to one another. And so when we look in the book of Revelation and we see the mountain that is thrown down, I think it's very clearly that God's judgment in Revelation chapter 8 is being passed down on the Roman people, on the government of Rome who was passing such heavy persecution to the Christians. And that's kind of the theory that we've been following through the book of Revelation, that Rome was just heavily persecuting Christians. Remember we talked about how they economically persecuted them, how they physically persecuted them. Living as a Christian in this time would have been very difficult. And God's judgment is being passed down on the people who are persecuting his followers. Even if we look into the Old Testament, this imagery of a mountain being cast down is not a good thing. Anytime in the Old Testament we read about mountains being cast down, it's not because God's happy with anybody. In fact, when mountains were cast down, it's normally an indication of God's righteous judgment. And we can reference Isaiah 54, Psalm 46. It's all listed in those passages. And so trumpet number two, Rome was identified as the recipient of God's judgment because Rome had been persecuting Christians. Let's move on to trumpet number three. Trumpet number three, Revelation chapter eight, verses 10 and 11. We're going to call trumpet number three, the leader of the recipient of God's judgment. 
Now, you have a really weird word that's listed here in Romans chapter 8 because it talks about someone, a star that fell from heaven burning like a torch, and the name of the star is Wormwood. Now, what a strange name to be found in the book of Revelation. And people have theorized for years and years about what this idea of Wormwood is means. But, but this idea of a star falling from heaven is consistent throughout the Bible when we read about it, especially in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. The statement, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, which literally means day star, right? Oh, how you have fallen from heaven. Now, in the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar, you remember Nebuchadnezzar, that old wicked king? He would admit that God was the God of Israel and the God of Daniel and then like almost backhandedly would turn around and, and, and change his mind. Nebuchadnezzar is described in the Old Testament as like a falling star to the ceasing of the Babylonian Empire. And so as we have trumpet number three being introduced, with this third trumpet there is a leader amongst the people who are persecuting Christians. There is a leader that is falling and many people think that this leader is Domitian, depending on where you date the book of Revelation. Nonetheless, God's judgment is being passed down upon the people who are persecuting his followers. Let's move on to trumpet number four. Trumpet number four, Revelation chapter 8, verses 12 down through verse 13. Trumpet number four is what we're going to call the impact of God's judgment, the impact of God's judgment. Now, we've had so far the idea that God is going to pass judgment. Then we figured out who God is passing judgment on. Then we identified an individual in that group that God is passing judgment on who's going to fall. And if you do any research into Domitian, you find that ultimately his name was just expunged from, from the record because he was just an awful person, and there's a lot that comes into that. But we see that the judgment of God that comes down has an impact. And we should understand that, right? When God passes judgment on people, there's consequences that come from that. When people have not lived the way God wants them to, there are consequences that result from that. And we see this here in Re Revelation chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. When the fourth trumpet sounded, we see here in this text that a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. Now, if you remember back to Jesus' life, I remember the sun being darkened at one point when he was alive, and it was close to his death. Luke chapter 23. And here what we have is that it seems the sun is being darkened again, but what is the purpose of it? You see, as a result of God's punishment, as a result of people persecuting Christians and God punishing them for what they're doing, you have literally the portrayal of of the devastation of, of Rome. That Rome is coming and falling apart because they've been persecuting Christians and God's judgment is being passed on them. One of the interesting things, and you've probably noticed this as you've looked through these passages we've been looking at, the idea of a third keeps popping up. And if you're like me, when I was studying this, I thought, man, what does this third mean? A third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the trees, a third of the sea, a third of uh, the sea creatures, the ships, the, the waters, the sun, the moon, the stars, the day, the night, all these thirds. When we look at the third in the book of Revelation, it gives to us a very clear picture that God's judgment is being passed, but God is providing an opportunity still for people to repent. You see, a couple of weeks ago on, on Wednesday night, we talked about God's long-suffering God extends his long-suffering to all of us who are in this audience this evening. God gives us opportunities to make our life right. And God provides opportunities for us to repent, but it's on our shoulders to take hold of them. And while God passes judgment on us today, while there are consequences to our decisions today, there will come a time when that will no longer exist. But still, we have John communicating that God is willing to give others time to repent. That's trumpet number four, the impact of God's judgment. You have the devastation of Rome, but you have the waiting of God for some to repent. Trumpet number four. Let's move on to trumpet number five. This begins our study in the book of Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. <coughs> 
apologize. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1, we have kind of an interesting twist in what's going on. And once we get through these, there'll be some application points to kind of glue them all together. So just stick with me as we talk about this, okay? Trumpet number 5, we have the agent of God's judgment. The agent of God's judgment. Now God uses some very particular language to describe this that I think is really interesting. And that takes us back to a particular moment in the Old Testament when God passed judgment on a group of people who had enslaved his children. That is Egypt in the book of Exodus. What we have here in the trumpet number five is the agent of God's judgment. John saw three things in Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 12. Number one, he saw a star. And to the star was given the key to a bottomless pit. You know, my dad used to say when I was growing up, I was a bottomless pit. Bottomless pits are just that. You can't fill them up, right? And so this star was given the keys to a bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. The second thing that John sees is that he looks into this pit and he begins to see... <coughs> he begins to see smoke rising up out of it. But it's not really the word for rising here in Revelation chapter 9. It's the idea that the smoke was walking out of it, which is kind of strange. Because when he sees the third thing in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, a swarm of locusts is coming up out of this bottomless pit. And to this locust was given power. These locusts serve as a very clear communicator that God's justice is on its way. God is bringing justice to the world. And we see throughout trumpet number five a number of military terms. For instance, the locusts were shaped like horses prepared for battle. They were wearing crowns, which are literally the crowns of victory. They had breastplates on. They sounded like chariots with many horses running into battle. And they were led by one named destruction. And still further, they had teeth like lion's teeth, and they had tails like scorpions, and they were designed for their purpose. So the fifth trumpet, as we see, is the successful waging of God's judgment upon people. You know, God, God, he gives us time to repent, but there comes a time when God's judgment stops. And it's time, not God's judgment, but God's uh, patience, His long-suffering, it stops. And His justice is on its way. And in Revelation chapter 9, that's kind of the picture. You know, like Rome has been persecuting Christians. The persecution of God's people has never stopped. It's, it's varied in its form and its severity, but it's never stopped. But there comes a time when God, His justice reigns. And we find this here in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. So the fifth trumpet is portrayed as God's war of judgment against Rome. Trumpet number five. <clears throat> <clears throat> trumpet number six. Revelation chapter nine, verses 13 through 21. Trumpet number six. We're making pretty good time getting through these trumpets. Trumpet number six is what we're going to call the result of God's judgment. The result of God's judgment. So let's, let's remember just for a moment where we come. Okay, We have the idea that God is going to judge. We have the recipient of God's judgment. Then we have a leader singled out from God's judgment that God's going to pass this. Then we have after God's judgment comes down, there's an impact. And yet God still leaves time for people to repent. And then finally the agent of God's judgment comes around and God's justice is on the horizon. It's time to get life's right. And finally after God we have the result. Sixth trumpet sounding John heard a golden altar which is before God. And this is what the voice says. Release the four angels which are bound at the great river Euphrates. Revelation, the altar that's often referred to, has a lot to do with the incense that's burned on it and the prayers of Christians are coming up to God. That's the picture in the book of Revelation. And so when we have the result of God's judgment coming, you have the altar who is the prayers of the mistreated saints, those who are persecuted, the people who are down and out, and God's going to take care of them. And then you have these four angels that we read about earlier. I know it's been a while, 
so you may not fully remember. But the four angels, it says in the book of Revelation, it was like they, they had a bed sheet. And they were holding the bed sheet back, and the bed sheet was God's wrath. And they were, they were temporarily holding God's wrath back from coming upon the people who were persecuting his saints. And he says in chapter 9, verses 13 and 14, Release the four angels who were bound at the river Euphrates. And so God, as he is standing on his throne... Now remember, all of these things we're studying in the book of Revelation, they are happening before John's eyes very quickly. Jesus stands up and takes the scroll, and he begins to open the seals. And as he opens the seals, the idea of what's going to take place begins to unfold. And we have God hearing the prayers of the mistreated saints and God having compassion on them. And suddenly, God in the trumpet number six says, Release the angels. I've heard the prayers of the saints. And it's time to take care of them. Revelation chapter 13, John, verses 13 through 21. And so God releases his wrath. And it's very interesting. The second highest number in the Bible is mentioned here in Revelation chapter 9. The only higher number than is mentioned here is a multitude that could not be numbered. This one is God releases 200 million horsemen. 200 million horsemen. Revelation chapter 9 verses 15 and 16. And they come riding in with breastplates of red and of blue and of yellow. And God is no longer offering the opportunity for repentance. And so we have the sixth trumpet, which shows God's odds coming upon Rome. And they have to face God with the prayers of the answered persecuted Christians. Just like in the seals, John kind of takes like an intermission here. We get to the end of Revelation chapter 9, and we have what is called often an interlude. It's kind of like a moment of silence like we had earlier. For just a moment, the story pauses and something else happens. We have an interlude between the sixth and the seventh seals. And in this interlude, God gives attention to faithful Christians and a message of hope. Uh, one, two, three, four, five things we're going to mention very quickly out of this, and, and they won't take but just a moment. The first thing that happens in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 11 and verse 14. I mean, that's a huge chunk, so I'd go home and read it. The first thing that happens is that John saw a mighty angel standing. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And that angel essentially is poised to give a message of hope to God's people. They had been torn, drawn out, persecuted. They were worn out, and the mighty angel is giving them a message of hope. The second thing that happens is that John then hears the message of hope. Revelation chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. He cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and that's a message from God. And John began to record what was told. But very interestingly, John is told to seal it up. To seal up the message that was uttered by the seven thunders, Revelation, here, chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. And that no one could hear this message at this time. The third thing that happened is that John begins to prophesy about what's going to take place. The fourth thing, he's charged to measure the temple of God and to measure its altar and the people who are worshiping there. The fifth thing, John is charged not to just measure that, but to not measure the court, which is outside the temple, because it had been given to the Gentiles. And all of this begins to build as John begins to talk about the two witnesses that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. And we're not going to get into the two witnesses. <laughs> yeah, Mike, I know. We're not going to get into the two witnesses tonight. But the two witnesses, in my very humble opinion, John begins to prophesy a dual message, one of hope and one of judgment. And he's joined by the two witnesses that I believe represent the church. And he brings about this message of hope and of judgment. And so we move ourselves back into the summation of, of the trumpets that are blown by God. I know I didn't spend time on these like I did the seals. Okay, we're going to try a new method here. The seventh trumpet is blown, and we have the final success of God's judgment. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. 
So this is trumpet number seven. This is the success of God's judgment. The success of God's judgment. Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. The trumpet sounds, God's patience stops, and judgment comes upon the kingdoms that exist. If you remember the 24 elders we studied before, they fall down to God and they thank Him that He is Almighty. They thank them, thank Him for being angry against those who are persecuting Christians, and they thank Him for His benevolence in rewarding the saints who have been faithful. And so with the seventh trumpet, what I believe to be the destruction of Rome and the victory of God's people is right at the cusp of history. You have a mention of the temple of God here in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19, which is a symbol of the church. You have a mention of the Ark of His Covenant, which is a symbol of God's presence. And the faithful people of the church are victorious. And they bask in the providential care of God. The seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. Now, if you will, take your attention just for a moment. Let's draw some application out of this and the lesson will be yours. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13. As the fourth trumpet was blown, notice what John says. And I looked, this is Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13. I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, one, woe, two, woe, three to the inhabitants of the earth, because the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Out of these trumpets we hear from Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13 that there are three woes that we're going to learn about following God. Three woes that come from these trumpets that follow trumpets 5, 6, and 7. Here's our application. First application we learn from the trumpets. Number one, God is fearful. God is fearful. What we have unfolding for us in these trumpets is the judgment of God. God has ended His patience on the persecution of Christians. And so we have the unfolding of God's justice upon the people who have been treating His saints wrong. God is someone whom we should fear. Now, as we've talked about before, a healthy fear of God is important. God is not someone that I run to a closet and cower from. God is someone who I understand is powerful, but who loves me and will care for me. God's fear is not something that casts out love, because John says in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear. And so if I have the love of God in me, I have no fear of the things to come in this life, because the God that I fear is greater than the physical fears I have. God is fearful. And so this first woe, God commissions an army of locusts, trumpet number five. An army of locusts that indicates his judgment, and he sends them to harm, Revelation 9, 4, torment, verse 5, hurt, verse 10, and to destroy, verse 12. God's wrath is something that we should take serious. I didn't always take my father's punishment serious when I was growing up. I may have shared this story with y'all before. I can't remember. I've shared it enough times. It doesn't matter. When I was younger, I was staying the, staying the afternoon after school with a friend of mine down the road. And the friend of mine, he, was, he, he loved Nerf guns, and he had bazooka Nerf guns. He had all this cool stuff in his closet, and we'd play with it, and Lincoln Logs. And, and I just loved going to his house. I loved going to his house so much as any young boy did. I, I didn't want to go home. I just wanted to stay. At the time, Austinville had a big 15-passenger blue van. My dad used to drive it around to do visits. He said it was free advertising. He'd drive it around to do visits, and he pulled that big blue van up into the driveway, and I saw him come in the driveway. And he came in the door, and he knocked on the, the, the banister. I don't know why dads like to knock on stuff, but he loved to knock on stuff. And he, he knocked on the banister. He said, Josh, it's time to go. At that time, I hit the closet, and I hid. So I heard him come up the stairs, and he came in my friend's room, and, and I had to figure out, man, what am I going to do? I don't want to leave. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so as he came into the room, he began to look for me. My friend ratted me out, said I was in the closet. And I heard him coming towards the closet. So I grabbed the closest Nerf gun I could, and I leaned around the door and pew, right between the eyes. I hid in the back of that 15-passenger van the whole way home, ran inside and hid under my sister's bed until he found me. That was a bad spanking. You know, I didn't always fear his wrath. I didn't fear his punishment. God's wrath is something we should take serious. 
God is patient with us. God is kind to us. God loves us, and he, he offers us time to change our life. But there's going to come a time where God's wrath is exercised on us if we haven't done what he's asked us to do. God is a fearful God, and we need to fear him correctly. It's what the Bible says in the book of Romans. We need to behold both the goodness, but also the, sever the, the severity of God. Because as the Hebrew writer said, our God is a burning fire. Application number two. <clears throat> Application number two. Number one, God is fearful. But there's a bright side to this because number two, God is forgiving. God is forgiving. If you remember back in trumpet number six, which is the second woe that we read about in, in Revelation chapter eight and verse 13, God's wrath destroyed a third of the trees, a third of the sea, a third of the, third of the sea creatures, the ships, the waters, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of that stuff. And as we mentioned earlier, this third symbolized the fact that God was patiently waiting, giving people time to repent. Indeed, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to forgiveness. Thankfully, God is willing to forgive and to forget our past. Thank the good Lord he forgets. Because sometimes we don't forget, do we? We do things and other people do things to us. And they may say they forgive us. And we may say out loud, you know, I forgive myself for it. But we hold on to it for years and we hold on to it like it's a weight that's holding us down. Thank God that he's willing to forgive and to forget our past. In fact, the Old Testament describes it as a stone in God's hand. When he forgives us, he tosses it over his shoulder and it sinks deep into the deep of the sea. Thank God that he's willing to forgive us. Just ask David. God forgives so number two, God is forgiving. We learned that application from these trumpets. But finally, number three, trumpet number seven, God is faithful. God is faithful. With the third woe coming, God is poised to initiate his judgment. And it says in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19 that God was poised to bring this judgment with lightnings and thunders and noises and an earthquake and this great hell was going to come down. Vivid imagery. And that according to the victory of God's Son, the victory of Himself, and the victory of His church, we can know that we are saved. We can be assured that God's judgment will stop. And so with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, just as God has promised, if we are faithful to him, we know he cannot lie, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. We know that he keeps his promises, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. When God promises us an inheritance beyond imagination, he is always faithful to his promise. Just ask Abraham. God promised him a land and God gave it. You see, people aren't always faithful to us, are they? I'm not talking about just in a marriage. I'm talking about in our friendships and in our relationships and in our job connections. People don't always hold up to what they say they will do, but God always will. Even in the midst of God's judgment that's passed down through these seven trumpets, that, that the people who are killing Christians are being treated horribly, God's judgment comes down on them. But at the same time, God looks down at his Christians and he says, You're mine. Come spend eternity with him. Jesus said it this way, In this life you're going to have a lot of trouble. But you can take peace and comfort in the fact that I have overcome the world. In God we will have victory. God is faithful. You know, as we look through what is being talked about in the book of Revelation, as we look at the unfolding of God's judgment, we learn a lot of lessons. But I believe the best lesson we learn is that we have to have our mind poised and prepared for the end of our life. The Bible says it is appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And I know with the judgment that God is going to be a fearful God, but I also know that he's going to be a faithful God and a forgiving God. The question is, what have you done with Jesus? What I've done with Jesus, how I've responded to the love of Christ, is going to affect what I encounter when I pass from this life to the judgment. How would you meet God today? What have you done with Jesus? Jesus.
if you have a need tonight. If you need to prepare yourself for the justice of God that is on the horizon like the locust rising out of the pit, my prayer is that you'll make things right with God. Whatever you need, please come as we stand and sing.